know, um, you might have came in the room this morning and with any sort of anxiousness, I can't really know what's going on in your heart, whatever troubles might be weighing on you as I'm singing that song, I'm thinking about um, some of our dear family members in our church, their little boy Hayes last night had to have an emergency surgery, and what are they standing on? Where is their hope when their baby is being operated on? And I don't know where your struggles might be, where your anxiousness not, might be, but to remember the promise of God, um, the hope that we have in Christ, what a precious thing that is, what a gift it is to be able to remember that, and to know the song we sang before that Jesus says that I go to prepare a place for you. And that even in the midst of our sinfulness, he also says that if you're a sinner and you've been, you know, we, have, we know all the entanglements of sin in our own hearts. Yet he says, if you believe in me, whom the sun sets free, is free indeed. Amen. That burden no longer rests upon you because he took it upon himself on the cross. All of those truths or what we stand on. That's the hope. That's why we can wake up in the morning. And without them, I can just tell you, I'd be in the fetal position every day, just, just sort of laying in the bed without any hope in the world if it weren't for Jesus and his promises. And so I pray that you would be encouraged, even as we sing this morning, that you would remember the hope that we have in Christ. Um, the scriptures are true. And uh, what a gift that is to us to be able to stand even when the ground beneath us might be shaking. And so let me pray. Father, I don't know the burdens that these dear friends came in this room with this morning. I don't know the pain and suffering or the struggles, the, just any, anything that they're, they're walking through right now. But you do. You are very aware. We thank you that we worship the God who is sovereign over all things. And yet is our Father in heaven who we can cry out to. And I thank you, Jesus, that your sacrifice on the cross gives us assurance of a future that is very bright, a hope even in the midst of trial, in the midst of pain and suffering. So I do just lift up the needs of this family to you, God. We pray for healing. We pray for comfort in the midst of grief. God, I pray that you would provide where there's been struggles to just even know how to make ends meet tomorrow. Someone is coming knocking. Lord, I pray you miraculously would deliver, provide. Whatever it is that is resting on our hearts this morning, God, help us to remember the assurance of your love for us. And help us to stand, not proudly or boldly because of us, but stand on the hope of who you are and what you have accomplished on our behalf. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, once again, good morning. It's so good to scan the room and see you all this morning with us gathered in worship. My name is Ryan, one of the pastors here at City Church, and so thankful that you are here with us. Before we um, jump into our text in uh, Matthew chapter 6 uh, that Jake read for us, um, just want to do a quick poll. I'm not sure if uh, anybody else is aware, but there's a football game on this evening. Um, it's a pretty big day, pretty fun day. So I just was going to just kind of take a quick poll of the room. Um, who, who is it that is going to be uh, rooting for Tampa Bay? Okay, so now we know... We're about to speak on prayer, and so we just know who it is that we need to be in prayer for. Um, and, uh, no, uh, you know, I, I, I marvel at uh, Tom Brady. You know, Tom Brady, Dirk Nowitzki, and myself, we have a lot in common. Um, <laughs> we're all the exact same age. And, uh, and so I just think about what uh, they do, what especially what Tom has done, what he can do at the age of 43. I... I literally, last night specifically, it just it was very, this is very fresh in my mind, that um, my back hurt. I, I ached from being in bed. So if, if you hurt from being in bed, then, uh, man, just to imagine that that guy can do. I mean, so much respect for him and what he can accomplish. So I hope that we'll be able to have some, uh, just, uh, some fellowship. You'll enjoy some time with good friends and family this evening as we uh, celebrate what should be 
our nation's holiday. Um, but <laughs> Matthew chapter 6 is where we are um, going to continue. And uh, we have been working our way through, if you're a guest with us, it's our habit and practice primarily here at City Church. We just work our way through books of the Bible or at least sections of the Bible. And so we have been in Matthew chapter six, 5 and 6, going to head towards 7, the Sermon on the Mount uh, for a number of uh, weeks, maybe months now. I think this is our 23rd message, working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus, in this message of that he delivered all at one time, and so because he's Jesus, he could just deliver all the words at once and everybody heard it and received it. Because I'm me, I have to break it down really small chunks and small bites so we can really digest it and um, hopefully process what Jesus is teaching us about himself in the coming kingdom. But he came and he establishes his kingdom. And um, if you have been with us for the last few weeks, you know that a couple weeks ago we began this new section in chapter 6. It was a new section of Jesus' teaching where he's really identifying the um, challenge or the reality that what we do, how we live our lives as believers, he's again, he's speaking to his disciples here, people who have put their faith that he is the Messiah who was promised from the Old Testament. And because he's the Messiah and they've believed in him, he's now teaching them and saying to them that how you live matters to God. God is a aware of how we live. And I know sometimes when we think of that, and that could be used in some senses to say or instruct us, or we might feel like, okay, well, God is watching you. And we make God out, and perhaps this is in even in some of your past, that God is a, uh, you know, kind of a, this boogeyman that's waiting around the corner, just waiting to get you and waiting to snag you in the midst of your sin. That's not the God that we worship, but the God that we worship is very aware of our lives. He isn't looking to get us. That's why he sent his son, Jesus, because of his love for us. So his heart is different, but he is very aware of who we are and how we live and the things that we do. And so Jesus, as he's beginning to teach us, how is it that we are to live in this life as Christians? What are our lives to look like? He begins in chapter 6, verse 1, with this warning. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. See, Jesus is very keenly aware of our sinful hearts, our temptation to try and live, in, in a sense, live for others and live with other people's thoughts of us in mind. And so even as he's welcomed these disciples into his family and they have put their faith in him, he knows that they're going to be tempted to worry about what other people do. And the reason that that is the case is because we care more about what other people think of us sort of on this horizontal plane than we do about what God thinks of us. And that's wrong. And Jesus is warning his disciples, don't do that. Don't worry so much about what other people think of you. And then he gives some examples. And what does he do as he lists out examples of people who are sort of doing it the wrong way or taking this, uh, looking at uh, the wrong approach? He points to the Pharisees. These religious leaders of the day that claimed to be walking with God and displayed and wanted to display, strive to display their holiness to the world, and he gives examples. And so he began, as we worked our way through a few weeks ago, talking about giving to the poor. Even in giving to the poor, something that God would call us to do, something that we should be generous and should do eagerly, Jesus says your sin sort of creeps in, and guess what? Like the Pharisees, you go and you want to give and you want to make sure everybody knows how you give, what you give, the volume and where and when. So that's one illustration. He takes a second illustration that we dove into beginning as we're going to continue really in this text, talking about prayer and how sinfulness even creeps in as we go to our Father in prayer, our sinful hearts can tempt us. And the Pharisees, they wanted to pray where everybody could see them. They went to the street corners, to the most public place in the temple where they could be seen praying. And the Gentiles who were trying to practice faith, they would just pray with a lot of words. They would use a lot of eloquent language. Jesus says, this isn't how you should pray. And so then he begins, as we dove in last week with a brother Kent leading us through this text, he gives us the model prayer of how we should pray. Notice he doesn't cast out prayer, of course. He doesn't cast out giving to the poor. He just says there's a better way. There's a way that honors the Lord. And there's a way in which we should pursue this in holiness and in righteousness. And Jesus taught us to pray, just as a brief review, to our Father. Our Father in heaven. Too often we find, I think, that we pray more for ourselves. We pray as the Gentiles did out loud so we can be heard or with lots of words so we can be received or perceived as, oh man, they are, that guy's really holy. Jesus simply says to pray to your Father. 
The God of the universe, the sovereign over all things, Jesus describes him as Father. And we spent a lot of time on this in the last two weeks, but it's helpful for us to remember that, that it's not what we pray, but it's who we pray to that matters. Not the words. So often we get caught up in that, and some of you will say that I don't like to pray because you're too prideful about your lack or your perceived lack of words. And God, Jesus is saying to you, I don't really care what you say. I care that your heart is after me, that you come to me as Father. It's who we pray to that matters. Jesus taught us as we come to our Father that we can come to this God who is so big, so great, so powerful, and yet, like a father, he knows exactly what we need. He knows specifically about us. He then says that we come to him acknowledging his holiness, that he is so much other than us. He's different. He's not just our buddy. Now, yes, he is father, but he is holy, and he is to be revered, and there should be reverence. And so as we come in prayer, Jesus is teaching us our hearts to model that we come to the Lord and we take it seriously. Yes, we can go to him as Father, but we can also go in reverence. And then after these opening statement, and let me just reread the entirety of this model prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So Jesus says in the next step of this prayer, after acknowledging God as our Father and His holiness and really just honoring Him and showing reverence towards His name, Your kingdom come. He tells us that we should pray and we should ask for the kingdom This your kingdom come, it's it's a little bit of a broken sentence for us, but we are in a sense, Jesus is teaching us that we should desire the coming of the kingdom. Why would he pray this? Or why would he teach us to pray like this? To ask for the coming of the kingdom. What does this mean? Well, if we think about this word kingdom, it's very critical in Jesus' teaching. I want to go back to the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. If you were with us a number, I don't even know how long ago it's been. I forget these things. Caitlin keeps me on track. But some time ago, we taught through the Gospel of Mark. And you might remember that in Mark 1.15, Jesus says, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. That's how he begins his earthly ministry, the very first words. And if you were with us, you might remember this illustration that I talked about, the fact that, you know, just think about the great marketers of our day. Some of you are in marketing and you think about words and think about slogans and color schemes and all those sorts of things. And Just think about the best ones, Apple or Coca-Cola or whoever else it is that I'm missing, all the ones that are going to have advertisements today. Can you imagine all of the ads that we're going to see this evening on this game The number of hours and millions of dollars invested in ensuring that they say the exactly right, perfect thing to make us go out and buy some chips tonight. (laughs) They will spend untold numbers of money and hours so that we buy chips. So we need this thing. So our kids think that if I don't have this, I'll die. Right? Now... If the great marketers of their day, they take that much seriousness about the words that they put into a 30-second slogan, do you think the God of the universe, when he arrives on this earth and begins his ministry and is ready to say, I'm here to start what I say, that the first words that he say, he didn't think of those very clearly and chose those perfectly in obedience to the Father? I assure you he did. And so when Jesus says that the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe, he is making a huge statement. See, all of the people that are listening to this sermon in the first century, they're hearing Jesus teach it for the first time, all of those that heard Jesus say that the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe, they were waiting on a Messiah who would show up and would establish a kingdom, a political kingdom that would overthrow Rome, all of their oppression, would reestablish them under the Abrahamic covenant that God promised to them that they would be a people set apart, he would have them, they would have no oppressors or any of those types of things. They were waiting on that. They were looking for a Messiah to come in that way. But then Jesus comes, and he doesn't come like that, so that's why he was rejected and so often denounced. It's because he came in humility as an infant. 
And he didn't come in any, with any political power. He came laying down so much of his sovereignty and his power to just completely wreck the way that people understood what the Messiah was to be. And they, so many missed him because of this. And what does he say? Although I didn't come to overthrow Rome, I didn't come to set you free from this oppression or that, the kingdom of God is at hand. He wants us to believe that. He is here. He has established his kingdom. And so knowing that he did that, he then instructs his disciples here to pray for his kingdom to come. So now you're thinking, well, I was, I was a little bit confused. You sort of enlightened me to confusion before. Now you've made me even more confused. Is the, is the kingdom here or are we praying for it to come? Where are we? Well, we're in, we live, and Jesus, as soon as he said those words, as soon as he arrived on earth, took on flesh, became man like us, he set the kingdom, he established it. And we live in this period, and the disciples that were hearing this sermon for the very first time were living in a period called the already but not yet. The kingdom is here, but we are waiting for the kingdom to come, for him to finish the work. And so... We look forward. Why do we sing songs that cast our hearts and minds to the promise of that future day when he will come again? It's because we need that, just as we said. How many of us walked in this room anxious, burdened, hurting, worried, concerned about something? And Jesus is saying, I came, my kingdom is here, I will come again. So when we pray, when he instructs us to pray, your kingdom come we are praying for more of this kingdom that he has already established. So he says, at the beginning of his ministry, the kingdom of God is here. I've arrived. We have established it. And now I am going to start building my kingdom one soul at a time. So here's what we're doing when we pray your kingdom to come. Here's the real heart of what Jesus is telling us to do. Pray for salvations. Pray for people to come to faith, to believe what I said in the beginning, that the kingdom of God is at hand. I don't care what you see going out on in the world. I don't care how broken, how messed up it is. Trust that I have come and my kingdom is here. Now, if we keep going, we'll look back one more place that's a little bit further along than Mark 1.14, the very beginning of this text that we began, the Sermon on the Mount. What is the first beatitude that Jesus gives? How does he begin this message? This particular message he begins, he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So here again, Jesus references this kingdom. And so what we understand when he's instructing us to pray, your kingdom come, he is teaching us and instructing us to pray that we might find people to realize the poverty of their spirit how desperate they are, how lacking they are. I can't reteach that whole sermon on blessed are the poor in spirit, but I'd encourage you, if you go to our podcast, go to our website, you can find the very first few messages on, from this series and hear that teaching again. But ultimately, in order for us to come to sa saving knowledge of Jesus, for us to believe the gospel, we have to be emptied of ourselves. We all know that. That's our own personal testimonies. Every single one of you, if you're a believer in Christ today, if I polled you and asked you to stand up, and then after you freaked out for a minute and you might get some words out, you would say, well, at some point I was you know, this, and then I, I just found that this didn't satisfy, and this didn't satisfy, and this didn't satisfy. I realized the poverty of my spiritual condition. I had nothing to offer God. And when I did that, I turned to Jesus. Blessed are the poverty, the impoverished in spirit. They will be citizens of my kingdom, he says. And so when we pray your kingdom come, we are praying specifically that others might believe that. We're praying for salvation. We're praying that others would come to saving knowledge of who Jesus is. We are also praying, though, for Jesus to come back and to finish what he started. Your kingdom come. Build your kingdom, Jesus, one soul, one community, one church at a time. And hurry, please, do it quickly and get back here. That's what we're praying when we say, your kingdom come. We are waiting for the consummation of the kingdom, that what Jesus began would be complete and here's what we can ho have hope in. As we pray this, your kingdom come in whatever language, however words. Again, this is the model prayer. 
But as we pray and ask the Lord to build His kingdom one soul at a time, to use us to build His kingdom, to display His grace and mercy to a broken and lost world, as He does that, we are also praying that He will come again quickly. And we're believing and trusting that He will come again. We're practicing faith. See, if I say, your kingdom come, Lord Jesus, come back, I'm having trust that he's going to do that. And how often, again, just think about this past week, how often have you lost sight of the fact that Jesus is coming back? He is alive, and he will come back, and he will finish what he started. And when you think of that, when you're reminded of that truth, I hope You might be a little bit like me, that it causes the things of this world to dissipate in their volume and in their weight and in their seriousness. Sometimes Laurel gets on to me because I don't freak out a lot. That's just kind of just not my deal. I don't get too high or too low and... You know, not that she does. She's not in here right now to defend herself. But, you know, she, you know she's, she's a little bit more, you know, like worried about this or that. Hey, we got all, she's got a million plates moving all at the same time. And I just, that's just not my thing. I don't get too, you know, wrapped up in that, those kinds of things. And I think the one thing that when I do, when I start to begin to get anxious about something or I start to get concerned about where we're going, how we're doing this, all these sorts of things, I have to remember that Jesus is returning. And that promise is for sure And so whatever is going on today, in the end, when he returns, it's going to be pretty insignificant. If it doesn't have to do with somebody that I love in terms of pointing somebody to Jesus, teaching the gospel, sharing the hope of Jesus, at the end of the day, he's going to return. He's going to make all these things new. He is going to come again. Revelation, the last book of the Bible, ends with this promise. Jesus says, I'm going to come again. And then John, in response to hearing Jesus promise him that he will come again, he says, come Lord soon. Come quickly. This is what we're praying when we ask, your kingdom come. By the way, just as an aside, this is why our church is so passionate about church planting. Why we felt the call to plant this church and why every bit of money, everything that we do, we try to keep our eyes pointed on starting new churches because we know that as we pray your kingdom come, we're asking God to build his kingdom one soul, one church at a time for other people. Every church that is planted is an outpost of this kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so as we plant churches all around the community, the nation, and the world, there are more places where the, the lost and the broken, the hurting world can come face to face with Jesus. The church, as you heard me say some of you this week, the manifold wisdom of God on display for the world to see. This is why. Because we want to see his kingdom come. And we are a part. We are thankful that we, in some small way, get to be a part, even in our activity as a church, about Jesus bringing his kingdom to bear here and now. He then continues, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, we have to remember, as we said a few moments ago, who we are praying to. You know, I don't know about you, but I found that it's sometimes just hard to get out of my own way in prayer. I go to the Lord in prayer, bow my head, Lord, help me. Oh, I've got this thing at three o'clock today. And immediately my mind just goes elsewhere. And I just told you about the fact that usually I don't have a lot of spinning plates in my mind. I'm kind of just whatever's right in front of me is what I'm dealing with. And that's all I really, you know, kind of my focus or my attention. So I never think of a to-do list. That's like never just walking around. If you came up to me and said, hey, what's on your to-do list today? I'd be like, hang on, I got to grab a phone or something. Somebody tell me what my to-do list is. Caitlin, please help me. Tell me what my to-do list is today. That's what I do so often. Laurel, tell me what my to-do list is. Because I don't really, it's just what's right in front of me. But the second that I go to the Lord in prayer, then my mind explodes with all these things that are on my mind to do. Isn't that crazy? It's just strange how that, it's not even in my personality to to really worry about those things. But when I go to the Lord in prayer, it's like, immediately, Whether it's the enemy getting a little bit of hold of me or some other thing, I just am drifting away. And this prayer that Jesus is teaching us, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, 
It helps us to remember as a model prayer that we keep our eyes and our focus on God as we pray. He instructs us to ask for God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And when you think of heaven, what comes to mind? What, what pictures play in your mind? I would guess that most of us would have some pictures of perfection. No pain, no suffering. Some of us are on mountaintops. Some of us are in fishing streams. Some of us are cuddled up in electric blankets. I don't know, whatever that dream world for you is, whatever you think of with heaven, no pain, no suffering, no challenges, nothing. Everything is good. Everything is right in the world. That's what we think about when we think of heaven. But Jesus says to here that we are to pray, your will be done on earth here as it is in heaven. Now, God's will, his purposes for this world, his sovereignty over all things is not in check here on earth. Sometimes because of what we see, the brokenness that we see, the, the, the hardships that we even experience in our own lives, we can be tempted to think that God really isn't in control, that he's not sovereign over all things, but he is very much in control. As we often say, quoting an old dead guy, there's not one molecule on the earth that is out of place. It's exactly where God wants it to be. He's in control. And we don't yet see things here on earth so often as they are in heaven. But what he intends to do, he is doing. So then again, now you're confused. So you're, If he's doing whatever he wants to do, why do we need to pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? This is what he is teaching us to pray. Remember, Jesus is very concerned. He wants his followers to be aware that our lives matter to God. Your life, the decisions you make, the way you live your life, every moment of your day matters to God. You know, students in the room, sometimes you think that the most important thing is whatever somebody said on that certain post, whatever invitation you did or didn't get to that party. These things, they are so big. The boyfriend or the girlfriend that rejected you or didn't reject you or didn't talk back to you, whatever those things, they're huge in the world to you. Well, let me just tell you that every single thing that you do in life is that big to God. It matters to God. So don't be so concerned about some of those earthly temporal things, but do be very concerned about how we live our lives, the decisions that we make. And so when Jesus tells us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying this prayer for ourselves, that in our lives, that we would be people, Lord Jesus, help me to be someone who does your will, who lives with holiness and righteousness before you. He's teaching us to seek and, and pursue the righteousness that we will one day have in heaven. Right now, we don't have it. We, have, we are declared the righteousness of God because of what Jesus has done, but we are in a pursuit. We want more and more and more of that holiness, of that righteousness. We want to look more like Jesus every moment of every day of our lives. That's the Christian's desire. That's right that we pursue those things. And Jesus is teaching us, this is how you ask for that. Lord, your will be done in my life today here on earth as it is in heaven. One day, I won't have to fight for it. One day, guess what? You won't have to ask Jesus for righteousness or holiness. You will live, you will have a glorified body living with Christ forever. But until then, we pursue the holiness of heaven. We are right to think when we think of heaven, there will be no sin. But it's possible for there to be less sin here on earth right now, right? We don't have to wait till heaven to eradicate sin or to push sin out of our lives. There will be perfect holiness in heaven. But we don't have to wait until heaven to have that be a marker on our own lives. It's possible that we have holiness here on earth and to live with that holiness. And this is what Jesus is teaching us. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life here on earth as it is in heaven. And if we want to see God's will, do God's will. If you want to see God's will, do God's will, which is to live with your heart and your mind oriented to him. You know, when I served in the military, they would 
put us in places. This is old school days. Now they do everything with lasers and all sorts of technology. I don't even know how they do anything anymore. But back in the day, they would put us somewhere and they would give us a map. And I was in a group that had to kind of learn how you get around in the world. And so they would give us a map and I'd be, be dropped down somewhere in the world. And I'd look, okay, there's a mountain. Okay, there's a stream. There's a forest over here. Find that on the map. Okay, now I know where I am. Because I now know where I am, I can figure out where you want me to go. But I couldn't figure out where I was supposed to go, which direction to head, until I knew where I was. One of the things as Christians that we need to do is to remember that we are here on earth. Our hearts and minds are pointed towards heaven. But if we're going to get there, we need to pursue Jesus. Pursue holiness and righteousness. We need to ask the Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help me to do that. In prayer, when we pray this prayer, we acknowledge that right now, I am not near where I want to be. I am far from God's holiness. But as I step into his presence and I ask for his help to do his will, he is faithful. He will do that. And guess what? Once again, if I were to pull the room and ask for some testimonies, there's many of us in this room. I know some of these stories as I scan the room and think about the lives that I've been able to watch and encounter. As we look at our lives, we would say, yes, the Lord has answered this prayer. Whether we've prayed it this way before or not, I've pursued Jesus and he's been faithful. He's made me to look more like him today than I did yesterday. This area of sin in my life, he has been faithful to help me just eradicate that and remove that as a plague or as a curse in my life. I've been able to step out of that life, out of that world in some way. I've been able to change. That's not your own ability, friends. You didn't do that because you were strong enough. You can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps hard enough to get yourself out of sin. Only Jesus does that. But as we pursue him, he is faithful to do that. And so Jesus teaches us, as we pray this prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that we are a part of God accomplishing his very purposes. And this is that mystery. God has a plan and a purpose for this world. He is executing and orchestrating. As we sometimes say, there are a million things in the world that God is doing, and we might be aware of three of them. But as he is moving about and doing all of these things, he's involving us. And as we pray like Jesus taught us to pray, your will be done in my life here on earth as it is in heaven, we get to see that. Here's the great news. Heaven is going to be great. There will be perfection, holiness, complete, just unity with our Father. But we don't have to wait for heaven to see God. We get to see him in our midst here and now. When we pray like Jesus taught us to pray, we're asking that we see God move, that we see him at work, continuing to build his kingdom one heart, one soul at a time, ultimately one church at a time. So Jesus has taught us to acknowledge three things, God's glory, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, his reign, that his kingdom has come and will, he will finish completing it and come again, and his will. And next week we'll turn and look at the things where we ask for the needs that we have. But as we pause here, we're going to receive communion this morning, receive from the Lord's table. And ultimately, as we think about what Jesus is doing in our midst, it starts with what he has done in so many of our lives in this room. That he, through his grace and mercy, he has won us to himself as he pursued us, as he laid down his life on our behalf. And so when we take communion, what we're doing is we're remembering that Jesus came. And when he preached this sermon, by the way, he had the cross fully in his mind. Jesus came knowing that he was going to go to lay down his life for you and for me. To build his kingdom one soul at a time. And as we do this, I have to acknowledge that there is more than likely at least one, if not a handful of people in the room who you may be familiar with some of this language. You may have been around churches even for some period in your life. But you don't know, you haven't ever really experienced the knowledge of the true grace of Christ. You have not believed. Jesus says, believe that the kingdom of God is at hand. Believe it. Believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And so 
as the worship team begins to lead us here in a few moments, I just want to invite you to take some time just to bow your head before God and perhaps let today be the day of salvation, the day that you would believe that Jesus came and in your sinfulness you had no right to have a relationship with God and yet Jesus came out of his love for you. He laid down his life for you. He took on God's punishment, his wrath towards sin. He took it upon himself when he went to the cross. And three days later, he took up his life again, proving his victory and his power over sin and death. We often say that the cross displays the depth of Jesus' love for us, how, depth, how deep he loves you, that he would lay down his life for you. And the resurrection proves the power of his love, that he didn't stay in the grave, but three days later he took up his life again for you and for me so that we would have that eternal life and we could be welcomed into this kingdom. And so this is what we invite you into. And so this morning, if you've never believed that as true, You've been wrestling with it. Perhaps you never even heard that before. I have no idea. I can't even, I can't be in your own hearts and minds and your experiences. But would you believe today? I would invite you as we begin to sing just to have a conversation. The Holy Spirit is working on your heart. Do not push that aside. Let God speak. And let today be the day of salvation for you. You are not a son or daughter of God because you figured something out, because you've done anything right. You are that only because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. So let me give you some instructions. Many of you have been around, but if you're a guest with us, the way we receive communion here at our church is uh, we have tables and some spaces in the back corner there. Just as the worship team begins to lead us, we want to just invite you to spend some time in prayer. Uh, scripture also instructs those of us who have believed that we should not come to the table without, before, without confessing our sin to Jesus. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. So turn away. Acknowledge those sins in your life before you come and receive from the table. But just as the Lord leads you, as after you've spent some time in prayer, come and take the elements and then make your way back to your seat and we'll take communion together. Uh, this table is open to all who would believe in the name of Jesus who believe he is who he says he is. This is not closed if you don't have to be a member of this church or a covenant partner, it's open to all. All that Jesus demands, all that the Bible instructs us to say is that you must be able to believe. You must have put your faith in Jesus. So let's pray. Let's go to the Lord, ask the Spirit to speak and then receive from his table. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your greatness, your sovereignty, how big you are. You are so apart from us, other than us, and yet you have invited us into your family. You are holy. And as the scripture says, Lord Jesus, you came so that we might be made holy. You who knew no sin became sin for us so that through you we might be called the righteousness of God. What an awe-inspiring, amazing truth that is. I am not worthy to be called the righteousness of God. There's nothing in my life that would say that other than your power at work in my life. And so I worship you, Jesus. We praise you. And we do pray as we just were taught that you would build your kingdom even this morning. Let your kingdom come now, Lord Jesus, as you show yourself. Holy Spirit, move. And let today be the day of salvation for someone who is apart from you, who has not known you as Father, as Savior. Would you just allow belief, tear down the walls around hearts so everyone might believe in this room. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen.